We have come together this morning to worship our Lord who is a missionary God. And he's gathered a people to himself as a blessing to all the nations. He's a, he is a father to the fatherless. He's a healer to the broken down. He comes to seek and to save that which is lost, to touch the untouchable love, those that are unlovable. We show that we belong to him by the love that we have for one another. So let us worship in unity and in love as we are empowered for the mission he has for us. Please join with me in our call to worship. We come here drawn by the power of God's love. We have come to hear the good news. And to find and celebrate new life. We have come remembering the words of Jesus. Peace I give to you. We are thankful for the words of Jesus and remember how he said, Do not let your hearts be troubled, and neither let them be afraid. You see, this is the peace that we live in. And the promise we celebrate here in this time of worship. Let us pray. Gracious in God, we are excited and joyful of, of this day in which we uh, celebrate the memory of those who have given so much so that we could be here and worship in, in joy and freedom. Help us to remember that our being here is not our doing. It's only as the result of the work of others, through your love, through your grace. Your love has surrounded us from our very birth, even when we haven't realized it. It's been present in your word, in the words and actions of others. For all of this, we give our thanks. And as we worship today, we ask that you would teach us to walk gently in this path of love, that we would seek justice, we would make peace and cherish the earth and each other. Enliven our imagination so that we can see through to a brand new future, the future that you have for us. Embolden us with your love so that we can live now as if that new had already come. For in joy we offer you all of our praise. In Christ's name, amen. Tied nice to get a bench Said I'ma serve my country Just like my old man July 29th Came and he was gone A shiny town car parked on that old gravel lot Two uniforms on the front door they knocked his mama started crying, she said, you were lying, where's my son? So I'll take off my hat, raise up my drink, to the ones that give it all for the U.S. of A. Say a proud for the families, Lord, give them strength, there's a folded flag in a frame. And I just want to say thanks on Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. Good men, good women gave all they had. They were brothers and sisters, mothers and dads. Your sacrifice will not be in vain. So come on and help me sing Oh, I'll take off my hat Raise up my drink To the ones that give it all For the U.S. of A Say a prayer for the families Lord, give them strength There's a folded flag in a frame And I just want to say thanks On Memorial Day Soldiers 
In my house, listening is a topic of, a major topic of, of conversation. I, I'm hard of hearing, and uh, I have a habit of not wearing hearing aids when I'm at home. And so, uh, in fact, my wife made comments we were coming over here uh, this morning. Uh, she said, there's a lot more conversation in our house now than it used to be. I go, no, it's really the same conversation. We're just having it three times. First time is when you say it. The second time is when I go, huh? And third time is I, I didn't quite catch that. So it's the same amount. It's just, well, I mean, you know, as we get older, our, you know, things slow down, our hearing slows down, our eyesight gets where it's not quite so good as it used to be. And, but listening is still a very important component, you see, in relationships, not just, just human relationships, but with our children, with our, with, and with God as well. There's a story about a married couple. They were up in years, and of course, as happens to all of us, they were a little, you know, just a little touched in the hearing department. And they were watching TV one one evening, and the lady looks at her husband, and she says, you know, I'm real proud of you. And he turns around and looks at her, and he says, I can't stand you either. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes listening, we might listen, but we might not hear just exactly what's being said. Uh, and that happens a lot in prayer. Uh, whether it be in confession, any kind of prayer. We, we're we real quick to go to God with our Santa Claus list of things that we need, you know, all the shiny new bikes and the, you know, and the new this and then something else. We, uh, we present all those, you know, like we're, we're, we're going, sitting on Santa's knee and, uh, all the things that we want. And then just about the time we get done with the list and Jesus is ready to speak to us, we're like, well, thank you, Lord, for all your blessings and amen. And we're kind of on our way and, we never stop to hear what the Lord has to say to us in return. So if you've been married for any length of time, you know that the communication is not just telling someone what you want to say, but it's also listening in return. That's the other half. And it's just as important in prayer as it is in anything else. So this morning as we pray, we're especially going to listen. We're going to open our, open our hearts, open our ears, so we can truly hear what God is trying to say to us this morning. Let's begin as we join together in our prayer of confession. We have heard about you, God, three in one, and you, the Lord of all, have heard about us, but not through secondhand reports, not from the tales that others tell. You have put your ear to our hearts, both when we prayed and when we doubted. You know well what we fear and question, what we long for, and from whom we turn away. And even when we become deaf to you, you never stop listening to us. In silence, in penitence, and in confidence, we do not repeat what you already know. We ask to be made whole. Jesus Christ said, greater love has no man than this. Then he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ has made the ultimate sacrifice for each and every one of us. And so through the power of the resurrected Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, your people, come to you today fully aware that we really, truly need your presence. We need your help in our lives. And yet, at the same time, we're aware that we often fail to stop and turn to you when we, when we actually need that help. We get caught up in all the troubles, all the turmoil of living from day to day. We get busy with all the goals that we've set for ourselves, all those goals that are imposed upon us from from our work, from our families, from our friends. 
we really do strive to be loving and we seek joy and peace. We desire to be gentle and patient and kind, show goodness, have self-control, you know, all those, all those, all those fruits of the spirit. And yet these are the very things that so often elude us. We ask that you would help us to root ourselves deeply into you to seek your will for our lives, to stop and listen for your voice during those times when we're troubled, to fully rely on you when we strive to do the thing that's right, to remember you and to trust in you when we are assaulted, to meditate on your goodness and your graciousness when we start every day, and kind of like trees but planted by the streams of water that put their roots down deep so that we can produce by your power the fruit of the Spirit. As we pray this morning, we remember with confidence before you all the concerns, all the prayers uh, that have been lifted up with this congregation, this community. We pray today for Phil and for Debbie and for Tammy. Lord, listen to your children praying. Thank you for being God, for making us your people. Thank you for growing in us, for helping us to grow. Thank you for the ministry that you entrust to us. And may your will be done in us and by us, both now and forever, in the name of the one who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I neglected to mention during prayer time, uh, Becky, my wife, is having a cataract surgery uh, this uh, this week, this coming Wednesday. She's a little nervous about that, so if you all would just kind of, those of you that have already had it, if you would just reassure her uh, and, and give her encouragement, if you will, and give her just a little prayer 
uh, to, to get her through. It's uh, anytime we have any kind of surgery, it can be, you know, it makes us a little bit on the nervous side. So just if you would please keep that in mind, it would be much appreciated. As we begin our journey through the scriptures this morning, we start with this text from the 21st chapter of uh, Revelation. Hear these words. One of the seven angels that had carried the bowls filled with the seven final disasters spoke to me, come here and I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he took me away in the spirit, this great big high mountain, and showed me that holy Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, resplendent with the bright glory of God. Main street of that city was pure gold, just as clear as glass. But there wasn't any sign of a temple because the Lord and the Lamb are the temple. Doesn't need sun or moon for light because God's glory is the light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk in its light. The earth's kings will bring in their splendor. The gates will never be shut by day and there ain't no such thing as night. They'll bring the glory and honor of the nations into the city. Nothing defiled, nothing dirty will ever get into the city and nobody who defiles or deceives. Only those folks whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The only one's going to get in. And then the angel showed me Water of Life River, crystal bright, bright, flowed from the throne of God and the Lamb right down the very middle of the street. And a tree of life was planted on each side of the river, producing 12 kinds of fruit, ripe fruit each month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Never again will anything be cursed. The throne of God and the Lamb is at the center. His servants will offer God service, worshiping. They'll look on His face, their foreheads mirroring God. Never again will there be any night. No one will ever need. Lamplight or sunlight. The shining of God, the master is all the light anybody's going to need. And they will rule with him. Age after age after age. Our second reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 23 through 39. A loveless world, said Jesus, is a sightless world. If anybody loves me, he will carefully keep my word and my father will love him and we'll move right into their neighborhood. Not loving me means not keeping my words. The message that you hear is really not mine. It's the message of the father that sent me. Now I'm telling you these things while I'm still here with you. The friend, the Holy Spirit, whom the father is going to send at my request will make everything clear to you. He'll remind you of all the stuff that I've said. I'm leaving you well and whole. That is my parting gift to all of you. Peace. I don't leave you the way you're used to being left, you know, feeling abandoned and bereft. So don't get upset. Don't get distraught. You've heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back. If you loved me, you'd be glad that I was on my way to the Father because the Father ultimately is the goal and the purpose of my life. And I've told you all this ahead of time before it happens so that when it does happen, the confirmation will deepen your belief in me. Trapped within 
My heart beats like a hammer. I can barely catch my breath. I'm thinking the worst and hoping for the best. On every scene, it's a heavy, heavy burden to carry all this burden when you can't unsee the things you've seen. It keeps going on when those sirens are gone. Now my shift is finally over. I gotta deal with what's mine and try to find a way to leave those tragedies behind. So I hug my two children, I kiss on my wife. Just another day of first responders' life. It's a heavy, heavy burden to carry all this burden when you can't unsee the things you've seen. It keeps going on when those sirens are gone. First on every scene, and it's a heavy, heavy burden to carry all this burden when you can't unsee the things you've seen. It keeps going on when those sirens are gone. Let us pray. Lord of all creation, we acknowledge that there are quite a few times when we fail to make that connection between, between you and how knowing you affects our lives and our vocations, between you and our daily work. And so now as we come to the word, we ask that it would speak to us in such a way that that connection gets to be clear that your will can be set forth within us, that our hearts would be willing to follow. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. On this Memorial Day, I want to share with you a, a, a text from the book of Acts, uh, chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. Well, that night, Paul had a dream. He saw a Macedonian standing over on the far shore and he was calling out across the sea. He said, come over here to Macedonia and help us. Well, that dream kind of helped Paul set his, set his direction. He went to work at once, getting things ready to go over to Macedonia. All those pieces seemed to fall into place. You see, we knew for sure that God had called us to preach the good news to the Europeans. So we put out from the harbor at Troas and made a straight run for Samothrace. And the next day we tied up at New City and walked from there over to Philippi, the main city in Macedonia. Even more importantly, it was a Roman colony. We kind of hung around there for a few days. And on the Sabbath, we left the city and went down around the river where we heard there was going to be a prayer meeting. 
So we, we took our place there with the women who had come, and we were talking with them. And there was one woman by the name of Lydia from Theatira. She was a dealer in expensive textiles. Everybody talked about what a God-fearing woman she was. And as she listened with intensity to what was being said, the master gave her a trusting heart, and she believed. And after she was baptized, along with everybody in her house, she said in the surge of hospitality, if, if you're confident that I'm with you in this and believe the master truly, then come home with me and be my guest. Well, we, we kind of hesitated, but <laughs> you know what? She wouldn't take no for an answer. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On Memorial Day, we usually remember those who have made the ultimate sacrifice and our armed services in order to ensure the freedoms that we enjoy. One of those freedoms is the ability to be able to come together on Sunday morning like we do and to worship, to pray in the manner that we choose. But in, in the past few years or so that we have uh, come to recognize that there are, there are others who are also on the front lines, as it were, who diligently give of their time, their effort, sometimes even their lives in order to, in order to serve. And those are our first responders, our firefighters, our police officers, our paramedics, all the other emergency personnel. These are the people that are very often referred to as those who are running in when everybody else seems to be running out. It's kind of a street level definition of what a first responder really is. Now, the sad part about it is before 9-11, we really didn't, we really didn't know anything like that because uh, we, it, it, on 9-11, we indeed did see a, a number of responders who rushed into those burning buildings to help rescue victims. But when those buildings collapsed, they, they never had a chance to come out. And so they are rightly honored for the sacrifice uh, that they have made for each and every one of us. It still remains true that emergency response workers are very, very quick to go into very dangerous situations in order to help other people. But there are a lot of cases that take place where they are not the actual first responders. There are some situations in which that role happens to be filled by somebody who just ordinary that just happens to be on the scene. Somebody who doesn't have any training, who's not a professional, at least not in any medical sense. Could be a driver who's just riding by when he sees a horrible crash on the side of the highway and he pulls over and stops to see what he can do to help. Or maybe it's a passerby, sees a house on fire, and the first response is he runs in there to try to see if he can get the, the residents to come out or... Maybe there's, a, maybe there's an active shooter and there's a, somebody nearby that's trying to direct individuals how to get out of the building, how to get away, or maybe you, somebody just happens to be there who's comforting someone who's gravely wounded, waiting for that emergency service to get there. The truth of the matter is, in a lot of emergencies, first responder might not be a professional at all. After the, the tragic shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School, a coalition of organizations got together and they developed a program called Stop the Bleed. Now, what this program does is it teaches civilians how to administer first aid to those who are uh, injured in those very first critical moments after a traumatic event takes place, and they use what is referred to as a bleed kit. Now, all of us are aware of the training that sometimes people go through. You know, you learn CPR. This is something brand new, something different. In traumatic situations, uncontrolled bleeding is the number one cause of death whenever those events occur. Whenever there's a shooting or an automobile accident or some other traumatic event, bleeding is usually the very first problem that is encountered. And in some cases, those professionals who know exactly how to handle a situation like that may not be able to gain access to that individual who's injured. But if there happens to be somebody on the scene that is versed in how they can stop that bleeding, then lives can be saved that otherwise would be lost. 
Stop the Bleed and, and other national organizations provide these training programs. They also provide the bleed kits, which they put into schools, they put into uh, uh, businesses of all kinds, so that average citizens, uh, boys and girls, folks just like you and me, non-professionals, can be prepared, can be pr empowered to assist in a bleeding emergency, you see, before help actually gets there. And in each of these kits is the same kind of resources that, you, that ambulance drivers or, or ambulance personnel carry and the military carry when they go out on patrol. Now, when we talk about first responders, it would be very easy to characterize what Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke are doing when they go into that district of Macedonia. That's the, the in case you weren't paying attention, that's the reading this morning from the book of Acts. Now they weren't, they weren't called by any radio uh, call or, or any alarm as like emergency workers are today, but they got this 911 call you see through the Holy Spirit. Appears to Paul in a dream. He sees a Macedonian and the Macedonian go, yo, y'all come on over here. And see, Paul, he just, you know, he's, he's a big believer in dreams and signs. And so that for him, he understands that as being a call from God. And so he and his buddies, they, they realize that, that they need to get things together so that they can go over and proclaim, proclaim the gospel in that region. So they set out from Troas, and that's where the vision happened. And uh, so they can go share the gospel in Philippi in Macedonia. So Paul and the rest of them, his entourage, they're kind of traveling from town to town and they're, they're strengthening the churches that already exist. They're preaching, encouraging folks. And at one point they intended to preach the good news in Asia, which is in Turkey, but the Holy Spirit says, mm, no, I don't believe I want you to go there. Put, kind of put the brakes on. So instead they decide to carry the gospel to Bithynia. But the Spirit goes, no, I don't believe I want you to go there neither. So they were in Troas. That's where Paul had the vision of where God really wanted to send them. So that's one of the dangers when we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us, when we truly put ourselves in the hands of the Holy Spirit, because we don't never know what the Spirit's going to do. See, we have in our heads, we have this kind of logic, you know, a sort of a linear logic, and the Holy Spirit doesn't look at things quite that way. If one of my favorite stories in, in the new in Acts is Philip, he's in Samaria and he's having one of the Billy Graham crusades. You know, he's having man, they had just folks lined up. They have an altar calls that last all evening. They're singing all 600 verses of just as I am. Folks is coming to Jesus hand over fist. You know, and he's just, oh man, it's just, it's great. It's every pre preacher's dream. We, you know, he's drooling at the mouth. And in the midst of all this, this great, huge success, God kind of taps him on the shoulder and says, you know what? I think what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to go stand down on stand by the side of the road in Gaza. Now I don't know if you know anything about uh, the the topography of Israel, but if you look at a map uh, in Jesus of Jesus Day and look at Gaza, you know that fifty miles from nowhere you hear folks talk about. Well, it's even on the other side of that. I mean, there ain't nothing out there, but it's like Fort Stinking Desert. There's if you can't eat if you can't eat rocks and dirt, you're in trouble. But you know what? He just, he does what God says. And he goes and he's just standing down there and he's looking over yonder and there ain't nothing there. And he's looking over here and there ain't nothing there. And, you know, make, make you kind of doubt till all of a sudden he sees a little cloud of dust over there on the horizon. And that, that dust cloud gets a little bigger and gets a little bigger and gets a little bigger. And finally, as a chariot pulls up, and there's a fella in there, one fella, and he's trying desperately to read and understand the Bible and he can't. And that's why. Philip is there, you say. We are the ones, you say, who have the bleed kit, and the Holy Spirit puts us in those places where we need to use it. Now, given our text for this morning, we could very easily ask the question of what would our response be if we were called, like Philip, like Paul, like these early disciples, to be first responders in somebody else's search for faith? What would that be like? Well, I know a lot of times our first response would be, mm, not me, I'm not trained, I'm not a professional. Uh, you need to go, go ask my preacher. I get that a lot. Somebody told me to come talk to you. You know, maybe you just need, we abdicate that to somebody else. 
But see, that's, that's not the, that call came to you. It didn't come to me. You have to remember, it's not shepherd that makes sheep. It's sheep that makes sheep. You're the one that that call came to. That is, you are the person that has the connection that God wants to use, you see, to meet the need of somebody else. And because of that connection, you are the one that has the bleed kit to stop that person's spiritual hemorrhaging. Now, granted, you might not have any formal training at all, but you can at least tell that person what Jesus Christ means to you. In the church, we make a big deal about evangelism. I mean, we got evangelism core every, it seems like every year we got a brand new program, evangelism of this and evangelism, and it's got all the bells and whistles and things you're supposed to go through. I think we're looking for that magic bullet just exactly the right words to say that folks go, yeah, I'm coming to your church. You know, we, but, but evangelism is really very, very simple. It comes down to, to just one hungry person telling another hungry person where they can find something to eat. That's, that's evangelism. And depending on the experience that you've had in Jesus Christ, you can address what other people are experiencing, the emptiness that they may feel. You can let them know that, that life does have a purpose. You've been there, done that. You might be able to address somebody's loneliness. Been there and done that. Explain that Christ has been your, your comfort in, in, in the midst of all that kind of darkness when you're alone. You might help somebody else face uh, fear by talking about the calmness and strength that Christ has brought you through the gospel. You might just be the very first one to ever approach somebody about God and share the basics of simple faith. In other words, you could be the one running toward that person. Now, granted, it might be nice if when that call comes, it'd come kind of like what happened to Paul. You know, we we are in, in the church, we, we like those those big we like the signs. We like flashes of light, you know, claps of thunder. The sound of trumpets. We like something to like a like a sign. We might want that Macedonian call, like like Paul received a vision or dream, kind of give us a heads up, sort of like knowing you're going to have a pop quiz on Friday. But most likely, see that call is going to come in normal conversations. You, it's going to come suddenly. It's going to come unexpectedly. It's going to be unannounced. Suddenly, somebody is going to ask you about your faith. Text tells us that when they were in Philippi, Paul sits down and he was talking to some women that he encountered in a place of prayer there by the river. Just talking to them, just, just good old folks, just sitting around shooting, shooting the breeze. He wasn't preaching. Any Baptist in the group, pay attention. He wasn't preaching. He wasn't banging on a Bible and getting all red-faced. He didn't harangue them about how awful hell was if they didn't, they didn't listen to what he had to say. He didn't say nothing about no sinner's prayer. He just talked to them. He just told them what Jesus Christ had done for him and what Christ had meant to him. Now, in the midst of that group, and we don't know how many was in there, but there was one lady by the name of Lydia. And while she listened, the scripture says the Lord gave her a trusting heart and she believed. Now, what, what else could that mean other than the fact that, that she was wounded inside? She was bleeding inside. It, uh, it happens to a lot of people. And Paul had given her something, you see, that was going to bring healing to her. And that happens a lot more than you think. There's a story about a, an English biology professor, Thomas Huxley, who was agnostic. Uh, he attended a party at a, at a country house where guests were staying over the weekend. And on Sunday, most of the guests got up and they got ready to go to church, but Huxley uh, wasn't going. Instead, he approached one of the other guests who was known to be a, 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 a very committed Christian. And he says, look, suppose you don't go to church today. Suppose you just stay here and tell me what your Christian faith means to you and why you're a Christian. Well, man, knowing that Huxley was a great thinker, was a, was a formidable debater, 
He said, but you know, you could demolish my arguments in an instant. I'm not smart enough. I'm not clever enough to argue with you. And Huxley said, I I don't want to argue with you. I just want you to tell me what Christ means to you. And so the man did. He stayed home from church and he talked with Huxley about his faith. And when they got through, Huxley said, you know, I'd give my right hand if I could believe that. Now, that was back in the 19th century. But how might something like that play out here in the 21st century, like with folks that we work with, or maybe the, the guy that you live next door to, it's always borrowing stuff from you. You know, the folks at the gym that where you work out, or folks you play golf with. All of these might have some vague sense that religion is important to you and that you go to church regularly. Most of the conversations that you have with these individuals have to do with, with either sports or the weather or, or your wife or, or something else, everyday things, you know. But as those relationships develop, you see, sometimes things, serious things begin to surface. Maybe that person asks your opinion about some ethical matter. Or maybe they want to talk about a personal problem they've got. Or Any of these are perfect opportunities to very frankly and very honestly share with them something about your faith. Now, just for grins and giggles, okay? Let's let's suppose Don is having lunch with Mike. Both of them are loan officers over at the bank. Don is about halfway through his blue cheese and mushroom double-decker hamburger when he, he wipes ketchup off his mouth with a napkin and he lays it down. He says, so Mike, you go to church. What is it that your church believes anyway? Well, Mike is just about ready to answer when, when Don goes on to explain. He says, we, we've got a kid, you know. Tara's four years old now, and Carrie and I are thinking maybe we ought to get back in church, make a habit out of it, you know, so Carrie could go to Sunday school and learn stuff like maybe some Bible stories like Moses and the ark, and, and then he continues to tell his story. He and his wife had a very uneven religious upbringing, and uh, so they don't really know all that much about God or religion or church, but they've got, a, they've got a sense that it might be something good, not just for their daughter, but for them as well. Now, <laughs> Mike could have told Don that it was actually Noah in the ark and not Moses. He could have just given his co-worker a very shallow and non-responsive answer, you know, talking in generalities about Uh, worship times and Sunday school times, but the questions, you see, give Mike the opportunity to ask Don about the experience that he has and then to tell about his own. And you don't have to go into any great detail, but just respond, you see, at the level of interest that's been expressed and just say what faith means to you the role that it has played in your life the role that it has played in the life of your family and your friends and what you're going to find is that don will appreciate it and you know why because it wasn't a subject that came up out of the blue that's a lot of things we run into when we used to do what we call a cold evangelism where you used to go knock on doors Y'all want you, you want to go to heaven kind of thing, you know, and and you don't get much response from that because it's just really kind of something out of the blue. But this, see, this comes up in the just simply in the in the nature of the conversation. It's natural. Nobody gets beaten up with the Bible, and it's in moments like that when somebody is asking for information that they are inviting us. You see, to be that first responder. To be that unembarrassed witness for Jesus Christ to share our faith in a very open and honest way. So the question is, what resources are in your bleed kit? Well, there should be three things. First, there ought to be some statement about what Christ means to you personally. Not some some theological Argument, not some, some mission statement or anything like that, but just something very simple, what Christ means to you. Maybe something like, well, because Jesus is in my life, I, 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 I no longer do blank. Or maybe because Jesus is in my life, I, I've been able to let go of blank. Or because Jesus is in my life, my outlook is a lot more positive, and then explain why it's that way. 
Second, there's a, a there ought to be a willingness to to teach or to explain to that person how prayer is a communication between them and God, that they have open access to God. They don't have to go through a mediator. They can go directly to God and pray, communicate. And third, there is a suggestion where the person maybe might learn more or maybe grow uh, into a, a newer experience, which might include an invitation to come to your church, maybe to meet your pastor, maybe meet someone who is further along in the faith in you that can really help this individual to grow, get them a little more fluent in the, in the language of faith. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to make all this sound simpler than it is or imply that, that, that a few well-chosen words are kind of like a magic bullet. But the fact is that people who are looking for meaning People that are trying to fill that empty space inside themselves often start by talking about it and talking about it to somebody that they think might be able to point them in the right direction. And if that somebody is you, well, then you become a first responder. Now, first responders aren't usually the ones that provide the whole solution. I used to work in the hospital, worked in the emergency room quite a bit. And uh, so what we would get, uh, especially on Friday and Saturday nights, we'd get a lot of uh, ambulance victims that would come in and the paramedics would kind of patch them up the best they could. And I got news for you. Sometimes it wasn't very pretty, you know, but they got the job done. They got them ready. They were the ones that did their very best to stop the bleeding and get them fit enough so that when they got to the hospital, they could be worked on and made whole again. So don't worry about whether it's pretty or professional or, you know, fluent, flowery. But if that moment comes when somebody within your circle of acquaintances appears to be looking for faith, may God be the one that gives you the strength and the courage to be that first responder. Let us pray. Father, there are times when our hearts ache, our souls wander, we're, we're, we're full of doubts. But even so, or especially so, we come to you in prayer. News flashes across the TV, droughts and hunger and unprovoked attacks on innocent folk. Newspaper deadlines talk about heinous crimes that just literally make us sick to our stomach. And we wonder how in the midst of all this we can make any difference at all. I mean, how are we supposed to respond in ways that, that not only give you praise and glory, but give hope to those that have lost hope, love to, that, to those that have forgotten what it's like to be loved, and joy to those who don't know anything but despair. Grant us your spirit so that your love and your mercy is apparent through us. And then give us the words to speak so that others can know of the hope and the peace that is available to them through you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember that you are missionaries for Jesus Christ. So as you go through this coming week, be a witness for Jesus Christ. Use words if it's necessary. Always be ready to speak up and tell anybody who asks why you are living the way that you are. Spread joy and hope wherever you go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.